Hello everyone. In the previous lecture, I introduced a topic called positron annihilation spectroscopy, which is a nuclear probe technique to study electron momentum distribution and also the defects or pore size in different types of materials. Now I will discuss another technique which is a, another nuclear probe technique. In fact, this is more like Mossbauer spectroscopy, wherein we study the gamma, angular correlation between two gamma rays and determine about the electric field gradients, electronic environment in different types of materials. So in this particular lecture, I'll introduce the topic of PAC, then the theory of behind the perturbed correlation, what is the instrumentation for perturbed angular correlation? What are the requirements for a particular radioisotope to be used as a probe for PAC? And some of the applications of PAC. Okay, so just let me introduce what is the technique of perturbed angular correlation. Perturbed angular correlation, essentially, let us first understand the angular correlation angular correlation between two gamma rays. Suppose you have a isotope undergoing beta minus or beta plus decay. So A x goes to A y by beta minus rather A plus 1 x by beta minus no, no, A y only z plus 1 z. So this particular decay scheme is for a beta minus emitting radioisotope and if it has got a cascade of gamma rays. So you have gamma 1 and you have gamma 2. The gamma ray will have their own multipolarities like magnetic dipole, electric quadrupole and so on. These are the spin states of the three levels, the ground state and the excited state. Then this gamma ray, uh, these two gamma rays will have a definite angular correlation between them. What I mean by angular correlation? You have a source here and you put two detectors at a particular angle and you vary this detector and measure the coincidence counts. So this is what we are going to measure called angular correlation. So as a function of theta, you will find the coincidence counts between two, these two detectors are not same. Depending upon the spin states of the three levels, you may have low counts at 90 and higher counts at 180 or vice versa. It depends upon the angular momentum of the spin states and the multipolarity of the gamma rays. So this is called the angular correlation and this angular correlation is used in finding out the spin states and multipolarities of the gamma rays. The expression for this angular correlation function double theta, it depends upon the, this akk are called the directional correlation coefficients. They are the latter 3j symbols, the clutch Gordon coefficients between i i l1 i for one first radiation, i l2 i f for the second transition. So that one can actually calculate using angular momentum coupling. And PK cos theta is the legendary polynomial of K as well. So this is the general angular correlation between two gamma rays. But if you have certain conditions in a probe, that is the intermediate level has got a lifetime more than about one nanosecond and it has got a spin, a spin more than half then it will have certain quadrupole moment, electric quadrupole moment. So these are the two conditions. The intermediate level should have spin more than half so that it has got a quadrupole moment and it has got a tau lifetime of the order of nanoseconds. Normally lifetime will be in picoseconds so then it is of no use. With these two conditions you will find that 
the electric field gradient around this suppose you have a metal atom and you have it is coordinated to different ligands and you have a crystalline matrix so the, the ligands offer a certain electric field gradient around the metal ion and then if it is non cubic then this electric field gradient will interact with the quarter pole moment to perturb this angular correlation and this perturbation of angular correlation leads to perturbed angular correlation and this perturbation factor is called gk so the angular correlation is perturbed because of interaction of the quarter pole moment of the intermediate nucleus with the surrounding electric field gradient it can also change by interaction of the magnetic dipole moment of the nucleus with the surrounding magnetic field there are magnetic materials so they are the magnetic dipole moment called come to picture now you can expand this legendary polynomial so you have a0 a22 g22 cos theta p2 cos theta a44 g44 e4 cos theta so normally we will take up only the second order term we will this fourth order term also is important but we require a little more elaborate arrangement so let me go into little more details about the theory of perturbed angular correlation and try to give you an example of a probe atom which is a beautiful nucleus for perturbed angular correlation 181 half nm 181 half nm you can produce by 180 half nm 180 half nm and gamma gives you 181 half nm and this 181 half nm undergoes beta minus decay in the half life of 42 days to the excited states of 181 tantalum so half plus state goes by 133 kv gamma ray it goes to 5 by 2 states and by 482 kv gamma ray you go to 7 by 2 state of 181 tantalum now you can see here this intermediate state has a tau of 10.8 nanosecond and has got a spin of 5 by 2 plus so it has got all the parameters nuclear parameters which is make it conducive for perturbed correlation so what happens when this half nm is put in an asymmetric electrical gradient like non cubic geometry you have orthogonal orthorhombic monoclinic type of geometry then in that that lattice positions you know they will offer a non cubic environment around the metal ion and so this non cubic environment will have certain electric field gradient so this electric field gradient i will explain here this will interact with the electric quarter pole moment of the nucleus in its intermediate state and split this intermediate level into its magnetic sum levels so you have the splitting in an electric field gradient is plus minus half plus minus 3 by 2 plus 5 by 2 unlike in nmr in nmr each magnetic state is split separately so you have half split into plus half and minus half so magnetic splitting of this level will give you six levels plus minus half separate levels plus minus 3 by 2 and 5 by 2 but electrical interaction splitting will give you only three levels now so this so when you have first gamma emitted to this they are populated in a certain way so when we say perturbation of angular correlation essentially the population of this magnetic sub levels had changed because of that perturbation so essentially what we have to do you have to solve the Schrodinger equation for the this quarter pole interaction or magnetic interaction you have to have the hamiltonian containing the quarter pole moment and the electrical gradient or like you say mu dot h for nmr similarly for 2 dot vz q not dot product this quarter pole moment and electrical gradient are tensor quantities so you have to solve the Schrodinger equation to get the eigenvalues and their amplitudes so you have the transitions among these magnetic sub levels w1 w2 w3 and their amplitudes are this skn coefficient so you have here the angular correlation function a0 plus a22 g2 p2 cos theta where g22 the perturbation factor is 
a sum of coefficients skn coefficients are the amplitudes of the frequencies and cos omega n t omega n n equal to n equal to 1 2 3 or omega 1 omega 2 omega 3 if the electric field gradient is axially symmetric axially symmetric means this eta value axially asymmetric parameter if it is zero we say electric field gradient is axially symmetric that is v x x is equal to v y pi in that case this omega values are integral multiples of omega 1 that is omega 2 is 2 omega 1 omega 3 is 2 omega 3 omega in that case the frequency can be given in terms of e q v z z Vz is the electric field gradient 0.4 i to i minus 1, where Vz is the second derivative of the electric field gradient that is delta 2 V upon del z square. So, you essentially what you are getting is the electric field gradient Vz if it is axially symmetric and if it is axially asymmetric, then you get this parameter, asymmetry parameter, which is tells you what is the asymmetry in the electric field gradient. So finally, the parameters you get out of TDPSE are asymmetry parameter and quadrupole interaction frequency. If each asymmetry parameter is not zero, that means if it is not actually symmetric, then the omega n's are not integral multiples of omega 1, they are dependent upon the eta. So this was the theory of PSE. You can go through the book on perturbative correlation and investigate, understand more of it. Now, the instrumentation for PSE is similar to the lifetime spectroscopy for positron spectroscopy. You have, you, to, you have to have actually three detectors. I have shown two detectors. The sodium iodide thallium detectors can be used. So, one and a half inch by one and a half inch sodium iodide thallium coupled to PM2, PM2 and the preamplifier. Then you take the anode output for timing and through a set of concentration discrimination and delay that becomes the stop signal of the time to amplitude converter and same is from the other side. The energy, for, you take the dynode output for amplifier, get the gamma ray in here and you generate the fast coincidence signal from here. This fast coincidence will strobe the TSC. What you get in the MCA, you get the time spectrum of an MCA. And you will have, if you have one more detector here, then you will get two time spectra, one for 90 degree or one for 180 degree. So basically you require to get this W theta as a function of time. Since you are doing time differential, as a function of time, you, are, you record the time spectra and you, they will find if, you, if, it is, if there is a final electric field gradient, then you will see on the normal exponential there will be oscillations because of that perturbation. So this you fit into the function w theta t into this function and you get then g22 t which is shown here. So g22 t is given by skn cos omega and t and the Fourier transform of g22 t will give you the frequency distribution. So, these are all, there are standard packages now software available. If you feed the data to data of 180 and 90 degree coincidence time spectra, you can get the Fourier transforms directly. So, you essentially get W1, W2, like in FTNMR, you get directly the frequency. Similarly, here also, you can get the like FTNMR, you get the uh, data by Fourier transform. Fourier transform of time domain spectrum will give you the frequency domain. So, what essentially you do, you have that counts at 180 degree, you have the counts at 90 degree and if you recall the this P2 cos theta is nothing but 3 by 2 cos per theta minus 1. So, you can substitute for two angles the value of P2 cos theta, you can get G22. So, you require two angle data to find out G22 t because you have A0 and A2 G2. A2 value is known, A22 is minus 0.29 for half name 181 or 5 by 2 state. So, from this experimental data, you can get this frequency data. So, you need to get F1, F2, F3, omega 1, omega 2, omega 3 and you will also get the eta parameter 
from the fitting of this G2 2 data. In fact, the ratio of omega 2 by omega 1, omega 3 by omega 1 will also give you the eta. So, let us see all the radioisotopes that you have, they are not available for PSE. There are few radioisotopes which, which can work as a PSE pro. Let us see what are the characteristics. First is the, of course, the lifetime should be long enough, maybe few hours to few days so that you produce it in the reactor or accelerators, bring it to your laboratory, put it in the system that fast slow progeny set up and acquire the data. So your data acquisition may take few hours or a few days depending upon the statistics that you want to acquire. Then second, the intermediate level spin should be more than half for quad pole interaction. Intermediate level lifetime should be more than nanosecond. Why this nanosecond lifetime? Because the resolving time of the instrument, when the two gammas are coming, then the, the, the time uh, resolution of the setup is of the order of 500 picosecond. So your lifetime should be more than the resolving time of the equipment so that you can see a, anything, any exponential decay of the level can be seen on the light time spectrum. Then the energy of the gamma rays in cascades should be more than or about 100 kV or more because as less than 100 kV, the window of detector will start attenuating the gamma ray. And of course, the, the probe should be compatible to the host matrix. So like hafnium, if you are studying as a hafnium as a probe, all these you know, derits or even titanium, zirconium compounds you can study. So you could see the radii or the chemistry valency should match with the one of the elements in the sample. So you can see here, this is the list of radioisotopes, the parent isotopes which you have to produce in the reactor, the half lives, what is the mode of decay, what is the daughter product, the half life of intermediate level lifetime and the two gamma rays which are in cascade. So you can see Zinc 62, Molybdenum 99, Cadmium 111, Indium 111, Silver 111, Barium 133, Terbium 160, Hafnium 181, Mercury 199M, Lead 204M, Nidinium 147, Europium 152. So, there are, these are the kind of radioisotopes which one can use. So, chemistry of elements containing these isotopes, these are the elements can be studied. By, and sometimes, you know, like indium, it will go very well in a rare earth, any trivalent metal ion, you can use indium as a pro. So, that kind of uh, analogy you can use to study different types of matrices. Okay, so let us uh, see how, what are the areas in which you can apply particular angular correlation technique. So you can use PSE in studying the phase transitions like you know if you start with the uh, orthogonal ortho, ortho, orthorhombic matrix and you want to go, it goes to monoclinic or triclinic, this, there will be going to change the electrical gradient. So any phase transition where there is a structural change or there is a magnetic transition, you can study by TDPAC. <clears throat> and the sample remains intact except that you are introducing some radioactive isotope. You can study radiation effects in solids. Radiations, you can introduce, maybe they may introduce defects or if you take an amorphous material, it may generate crystallinity or if you have a crystalline matrix, it may generate amorphous amorphosity or it, it can be even, you know, polymerization, it can lead to change in the molecular weight. So, wherever there is a change in the chemical environment by radiation, we can uh, study by TTPAC. The binding site of metal ion in biomolecules, in fact, in, in, in bio, biochemistry, people are interested in knowing that like you have a big molecule, protein molecule, where is that this metal line is going and are trying to attach to this big molecule. So, what is the geometry around that uh, you can study by using TTPC. Another is diffusion in solids. So, for example, hydrogen diffusion in different materials. So, when the, when the, before you have a material called palladium, uh, or they, are, they absorb hydrogen, even zirconium absorbs hydrogen. So, when the hydrogen is going in the material, it may be diffusing out and during the diffusion, there is a change in the electronic environment around the probe atom and that change in the electronic environment can be probed by using ETPAC. 
complexation of the metal ion the ligand or polymerization of the metal ions can be also studied using dps so i will just give you some examples of uh, perturbed angular correlation uh, one of our colleagues has studied what is called as the haze transitions in hafnium oxide and hafnium oxide as a function of pressure but at high pressure it is a hafnium oxide undergoes changes so that kind of study you can do so if you have hafnium oxide radiate in the reactor and at room temperature at atmospheric pressure you study the time differential perturbed correlation you can determine the parameters like water pool interaction frequency in fact i forgot to tell you about this delta part actually this g22 equal to skn or omega n t so this is for a system which is perfect there is no no fluctuation in the electric field gradient but if the omega is changing so electric field gradient is changing what is omega omega n can be n omega 1 and this omega 1 is eq vzz upon 4i 2i minus 1 so this electric field gradient if it is changing suppose the metal ion is not sitting in the same environment everywhere then there will be a distribution of frequencies and that distribution of frequencies will give you minus half delta square omega n square p square so this is like you can use a Gaussian distribution of frequencies so this delta is the distribution in the frequencies and percentage what is that like 0 0.054 into omega so then this is the asymmetry of the electric field radiant so what uh, uh, our uh, my student uh, he, he did it as a part of his work so at atmospheric pressure this is the kind of data you get and then you apply you put this half num oxide in a diamond and you will sell and then study so at 40 gigapas 45 gigapascal you can see that the water pool interaction parameters the frequency the delta value and the asymmetry parameter have been changed significantly so you can carry out this study as a function of pressure and see what type of geometry that it is changing when you apply pressure so pressure induced phase transitions can be studied by means of this technique similarly the radiation effects in solids can be studied by ttpse the radiation effects in solids sir, uh, one of the studies you know was uh, recently carried out is perovskites strontium titanate and calcium titanate they are being investigated as a host matrix for the waste that is generated in the reprocessing of the spent nuclear fuel and therefore lot of materials are being investigated whether they can be they can be used to accommodate the fission products and minor actinides and then for final disposal into a repository so this uh, by gel combustion uh, method they were synthesized and so the ex first you you verify them by x-ray diffraction and dope half name 181 as a pro so you, your doping concentration is of the order of 0.1 percent or 2.5 percent so that you don't alter the crystalline structure very much and of course titanium in the half name you can go and sit in the place of titanium so at their ionic radii are very close then after the you dope, maybe you can anneal also, or you can dope while preparing the compound and then study the time differential perturbed angular correlation. So PAC and TDPAC, the difference is that in TDPAC you are recording the time spectra. So TDPAC is essentially PAC only, and you can see as a function of time in nanosecond, the G22 is, is in, in the case of strontium titanate, which is a cubic lattice. So it is, it is supposed to have no electric field gradient, but even then you get some uh, static interaction. And in uh, calcium titanate, you get uh, a well-defined electric field gradient. So by, after this, now you can study the electric field gradient. And then once you irradiate with the different radiations like gamma rays or electrons or alpha particles, then one can study effect of radiation. Essentially, you irradiate at a particular dose and determine the, the 
water pore interaction parameters, the frequency W, the distribution of frequency delta, and the asymmetry of the electric field gradient. Similarly, the biological applications, very interesting uh, studies can be done by in biology where the particular metal ion is going to sit by the big macro molecule. So, one of the study I have taken from literature is the binding site coordination geometry of carboxypeptidase and what essentially they have done that they have uh, used 111 cadmium as a probe nucleus and this 111 cadmium was doped into this material. So, it is essentially not as a doping, it is going to bind. So, this cadmium will bind the carboxypeptidase in a particular geometry and what is the site, what is the coordination environment around cadmium one can study using TTPAC. So what they found that in the when the this carboxypeptidase is in the coded in the crystalline phase, in the crystalline phase they found that there is only one uh, what we call as the NQI means a, a nuclear quadrupole interaction. A nuclear quadrupole interaction is essentially nothing but the interaction between the quadrupole moment and the electric field gradient. So this is also called as the NQR, nuclear quadrupole resonance like mos bauer spectroscopy is like nuclear quadrupole resonance. So here it is nuclear quadrupole interaction or we can also call it hyperfine interaction because the magnetic, the, the intermediate level is split into its uh, magnetic substrates. So what they found that in the, in the crystalline form you get distinct frequencies omega 1, omega 2, omega 3 and uh, one can find out the electric field gradient and match with the X-ray data. But what they found is that when we you try it in the solution form, in the solution form they found like particularly sucrose solution at different con chloride concentrations, 1 molar sodium chloride and 8 millimolar chloride ion then they found that these peaks have become broad. You can see the peaks have become broad here also. So what? Why these peaks get broadened? Because they, if there is a, if there are two sites. So cadmium is sitting in sites which are there is a fluctuation in the electric field gradient around cadmium, and that can happen if there are two sites. So it, it, some some cadmium ions are sitting in one geometry, other cadmium ions are in other geometry. So, there is a dynamic exchange between two binding sites like tautomerism. Now, the time scale, the time scale of the uh, that interaction exchange has to be at a time scale. If, if it is a single peak, then it is a much shorter time scale. If the if the there are two peaks you see, then it is happening at a longer time scale than the TDPC. TDPC time scales are observed of hundreds of picoseconds. That is the kind of difference because the resolving time of TDPAC setup is of the order of 500 picosecond. So anything, any event which happens at uh, of that time, then you may not resolve it. But that may lead to broadening of the TDPAC spectrum. So the net result of this uh, two exchange, uh, two, two sides you no know, exchanging, so it, it can lead to like hydrogen bonding between two species, two, two functional groups in the molecule can lead to uh, two different geometry around the metal ion. So, this kind of studies have been seen in TDPAC and then we can explain the behavior, why, why these structures are changing, what, what is happening in the structure at those under those chemical conditions. Another very interesting uh, 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 in the, the example in the literature in the phase transitions is on what you call as the spin frustrated copper ferrites. So this copper ferrites actually they have lot of applications and the powder neutron diffraction of this material showed two magnetic transitions at very low temperature 11k and 16k. So you can see what they have done that you, they want to now investigate what are the kind of uh, geometries. So neutron diffraction will give you that there are two transitions taking place. Now you want to go further investigation. So using 111 indium as a probe, they wanted to know what kind of structures, what kind of interactions they are. So it's a magnetic material. 
and if there is a non cubic geometry then there will be electric interaction as well as magnetic interaction so there is a combination of electric and magnetic interaction so by electric field gradient interaction with quad pole moment you have this like splitting of i by 2 into plus minus half plus minus 3 by 2 plus minus 5 by 2 and if you have a magnetic field it will split each one of them into its magnetic solid so you have six levels now so <clears throat> the combined electric and magnetic interaction can be studied by means of pdps so what they found that at for the for example you have the room temperature data and uh, at somewhere at 4.2 there is a broadening in the so this 11 11 k kelvin is, uh, is somewhere in the middle of the two and so they essentially try to study the as a, uh, and when they were, there is a transition so there is a phase transition between the in the, these materials so what is happening to the structure the structure could change or the there could be change in the because of the magnetic interaction so this interplay between the electric and magnetic fields can lead to this phase so but they actually found that the weak weak component between the two electric and magnetic was going to broaden the frequencies of the stronger component so these are the kind of studies uh, people have uh, studied using TDPSE. So there are innumerable examples so one can take up. I would, I just wanted to illustrate that if you know if you know that the fundamentals of TDPSC or positron spectroscopy, and if you are working in an area where you no know, special information you want, then by setting up these instrumentations, you can go for studying the processes chemical environment around the metal ions and you it requires a bit of nuclear instrumentation so you require to have the proper knowledge of detectors the energy resolution time resolution if you set up the system and have a good data acquisition system then you can study different areas in physics and chemistry so that is what was the purpose of these lectures that it induces you to take up the, in nuclear chemistry, what are the areas in which one can take up research problems for investigation? And they are not done in isolation. This is like we have TDPC setup or a positron setup. These are already, you know, you, you need to have the complementary information from other techniques. So you combine the information from other techniques like XRD or other techniques and use this data to op obtain a complete picture around the, about the system. So, depending upon the application you have or depending upon the problem you want to understand one can choose different type of techniques and positron and psc provide such avenues for you so i'll stop here thank you very much